Welcome back to Oil & Gas with Energy Law Prof. Today we're going to talk about two different kinds of conservation rules. Well location rules, i.e. where can you put your well, and allowables, how much can you pump from that well. So first let's talk about some of the exceptions you might make to the normal spacing and density rules that we learned a little bit about in the last lesson. So to protect your correlative rights, you can make an application to an oil and gas agency to drill a well that doesn't meet the normal spacing and density rules. And there's typically two main reasons for that. So one would be if drilling in the normal location would leave oil and gas in the ground. Remember, that's what we mean by waste. If you would not be able to produce some of the oil and gas that's there, if you didn't drill a well, you may be able to get an exception. Secondly, if your neighbor has a well that is drawing off your oil and gas without giving you a chance to produce it, if you can only drill in the normal location, you may get an exception to drill somewhere else. So first, let's look at that first example, which is if I don't get this exception well, there's going to be oil left in the ground. There's going to be waste. So think about this sort of cir circumstance where you're White Acre. So we're looking at Black Acre. Let's imagine that each of these square properties are 20 acres and that Black Acre gets to drill that well in the middle of its property. That's the designated location under the spacing rules. And let's imagine that Black Acre's well is able to drain most of the oil on Black Acre's land, but none of the oil on White Acre's land. Now imagine that that reservoir only extends through part of White Acre's land. It doesn't extend through the whole uh, piece of land, the whole 20 acres. And so if White Acre were just to drill at that legal location in the middle of the plot, they would not be able to produce any oil and gas. So without an exception, allowing drilling on the west side of this plot closer to black acre there would be oil left in the ground that would be waste and so white acre can ask for an exception to prevent waste okay second kind of exception an exception to protect correlative rights so here imagine again same circumstance so the reservoir is just on the western edge of white acres property but extends throughout black acres property but now this time imagine that black acre because this rock is more permeable can actually drain the whole reservoir with a single well in the middle of black acre so in effect, there's no real waste here. There's no oil and gas that's left in the ground if White Acre is only able to drill this one well, which isn't even worth it because it doesn't enter a reservoir. But in a sense, White Acre's correlative rights are not being protected because as we discussed, correlative rights are supposed to give you a fair opportunity to produce the oil and gas under your track. And we know that in this case, if White Acre follows those spacing rules and drills in the middle of the track, White Acre will never be able to produce this oil and gas on the west side of the track. Instead, that will go to Black Acre. So sometimes White Acre is going to get an exception in this circumstance to prevent confiscation or to protect correlative rights, to prevent Black Acre from producing all the oil that's on White Acre's land. Let me give you an example of how these exception wells can work in practice. This is described on page 705 in your book. And again, later in the book, it's just in the notes. This, you don't have the full case. But this is a case in Montana from 1965. What happened here is that uh, there was an oil and gas company, Sumatra, that drilled a well on the east side of section 15. Patty owns the west side of section 14. Those are neighboring properties. Remember, if we're counting those sections within a township, we count uh, you know, first from right to left, then back uh, from left to right, and so forth. And so you can see that the east side of section 15 neighbors the west side of section 14. Now, this well that Sumatra, which was an oil company, drilled was as close as it could be to the property line for oil. But it was too close to Patty's property for a gas well. The problem comes because the well, when it comes in, actually has natural gas rather than oil. Now you might ask, why are there different rules for oil and gas? Well, typically, more spacing is required for gas wells for two reasons. 
One, natural gas, because it's a gas, is able to travel more easily uh, under the ground, and so it might drain a wider piece of property. Secondly, because natural gas is less valuable typically than oil, almost always in oil and gas fields it's less valuable, then you don't want to have quite as many wells for natural gas because it's just not worth financing a well for uh, to produce just a little bit of natural gas. You need a larger amount to justify financing that well. So the spacing rules require natural gas wells to be set further back from the land. Now what's weird here is that after Sumatra, the oil company, drilled a well looking for oil as close as it could to Patty's property, it turned out there was no oil, there was only natural gas. So then the oil company has a little bit of a dilemma. Should I go ahead and drill another well uh, back from the property line, which would be appropriate for natural gas? I mean, that seems like kind of a waste of money to drill a whole new well when there's already one well that's able to produce natural gas. So Sumatra goes to the Montana Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Again, very sensible name for an oil and gas regulator. They go to the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and say, let me have an exception. Let me keep producing this well even though it's natural gas and not oil. So, so far so good. But now Patty comes to the uh, Montana Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and says, hey, wait a second, this well is right next to my property, closer than would normally be allowed for natural gas. And so I'm worried that it's pulling natural gas from my property to this well that's actually very close to my property. So please allow me to drill a well close to their property line so that we can have compensated drainage. I'll get some of their gas. They'll get some of mine. Unfortunately for Patty, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission says no. They say, look, that was a one-time deal because they thought they were drilling for oil and got gas. We're not making an exception to these rules for you. So effectively, just to give you a little picture of what's happening here. So Sumatra has drilled a well that is too close. You can see it's quite close to the property line. Now, probably the legal location for a gas well would have been back here, but they have instead drilled what they thought was an oil well, turned out to be gas quite close to Patty's property. Now, Patty says, look, legally, this is where I'm allowed to drill, but in this circumstance, I should be allowed to drill here. And you could see one reason that might be particularly uh, important in this picture, which is imagine that the edge of the reservoir just went through the west of Patty's property. And so drilling in the legal location wouldn't actually give any oil. And so Patty's request is then doubly important. Not only is it kind of this fairness request, hey, I should be allowed to be as close to the property line as Sumatra is, but also that's the only way for Patty to actually get natural gas from this reservoir. So why, uh, how do the courts look at this decision of the Montana Oil and Gas Conservation Commission? Well, they have a problem with this part of the decision. The Oil and Gas Conservation Commission says, look, we're only considering conservation, not really the equities of the circumstance. And as we've discussed before, at times that can be a bias of these oil and gas conservation commissions. They say, you know what, I'm not so worried about who gets a little more oil or who gets a little bit more gas. I just want to assure that we get the maximum efficient recovery from this field with the fewest number of wells. And, you know, Montana's Oil and Gas Conservation Commission makes the mistake of saying that out loud. They say, look, we're just concerned with not having too many wells, not the equities of the scenario. So when Sumatra said, give us an exception or we're going to have to drill a whole separate well, we said, OK, but there's no reason for us to approve this extra well for Patty. Now, the Montana Supreme Court doesn't like that approach. And they say, look, you have to consider the equities and the correlative rights of the parties. So you have to consider the fact that Sumatra has gotten to go unusually close to the property line. And so maybe Patty should be as well. And certainly you might have to consider whether Sumatra as well is pulling natural gas from Patty's land that Patty should have a fair opportunity to try to produce. Okay, so that's the decision in this case. You can see there's actually a certain parallel with the Larson case as well, where the Supreme Court is protecting sort of the equities of 
the parties in the case, whereas the Conservation Commission seems to be more concerned with just the economic overall benefits of oil and gas and not wanting too many wells. Let's consider a couple more hypotheticals in the case and see if that might have changed the decision. So let's imagine that in that Patty case, suppose that Sumatra's well had been drilled at a routine legal location for gas. So let's say that there wasn't this extra part that Sumatra had been given an exception, and so shouldn't Patty get an exception? What do you think the court would have done then? I think it's hard to say in that circumstance because what, you know, Patty still might have the argument that if the reservoir is just on the west side of my land, and if I'm forced to drill in a legal location, there really may be no natural gas. And so maybe I should be allowed to drill closer to the line to protect my correlative rights to uh, make sure all the oil and gas isn't draw drawn off from underneath my property. On the other hand, without that kind of fairness argument about give me the same exception you gave them, maybe that wouldn't have been enough to win in the Supreme Court in this case. Another hypothetical. Imagine that the facts of the case indicated that Patty's well, which was the exception that was proposed, was closer than normally would be allowed to the property line and then much closer than would normally allowed to Sumatra's well because Sumatra's well was also closer than average to the property line. What if there had been facts that indicated that Patty's well would have reduced recovery from Sumatra's well? Now, in this case, I don't think it would have changed the outcome too much because I actually think this is the background assumption. I mean, we already know that both of these wells are going to be closer than would be normally allowed for natural gas wells. And so I think it's probably understood by all the parties here, even if it wasn't necessarily proved by the parties, that there will be some amount of reduction in production from both wells from having these wells so close to each other. But I think you should think about, in general, how you would have addressed that if you were the conservation agency in these circumstances and how you would have addressed it if you were the court. You know, what could the conservation agency have said to protect its decision so it would have been less likely to be overruled in court? Okay, let's talk about allowables a bit. Remember, this is how much you are allowed to produce from a well every day. Typically, allowables are made on an acreage basis. So if you have an 80-acre property, you're going to be able to produce twice as much as a well with only 40 acres attached to it. Now, as we've seen in some of the cases so far, it's very common that most of the wells in a field would have the same number of acres attached to it. And so then they would get the same amount of allowables. But there's a lot of circumstances where that's not the case. You know, for one thing, sometimes the individual properties don't really line up well with 80 acres. And so you might have to have one that's you know, 65 acres or 55 acres, etc. And if so, it's going to get a proportionally smaller amount. Uh, the other reason that you often get a different amount of acreage uh, or allowables is think about that Patty circumstance again, where Patty, one of Patty's arguments is, look, I think this reservoir is really over on the west side of my property, not throughout the entire property. Well, you can imagine that if that's the case, then the normal assumption that justifies determining allowables based on acreage doesn't really apply. Because normally we say, look, everybody's got 80 acres on this reservoir, and so everybody probably has the same amount of oil and gas under their land, and so they probably deserve the same allowables. That's why we typically determine allowables based on acreage. But if what Patty is saying is, you know what, in my case, this reservoir doesn't extend under my full 80 acres. Actually, it's only under the west 20 acres. Well, in that circumstance, maybe then Patty should only be allowed to produce 20 of those acres rather than the full 80. And so you might in that circumstance get a allowable for that well that was just one fourth, you know, 20 rather than 80 of the normal allowable for a well where the assumption is there's 80 acres of oil and gas reservoir underneath this property. 
We'll see other ways that it can get more complicated. Another thing that happens with allowables is that they often change over time. So one main reason for allowables is to preserve that reservoir pressure in the oil and gas reservoir. And so often that means lowering them over time as the oil and gas reservoir pressure lowers to ensure we're still producing in an orderly fashion that allows us to squeeze as much oil as we can out of that reservoir before it stops producing. This is basically, to give you a picture of it, sometimes we talk about preventing interfingering of water or watering out of those wells. So I've shown you this picture before, but let's talk about it again for just a little bit. So remember that we often in a reservoir have oil that's press, being pressed up by water and pressed down by gas and the result is that the oil is being squeezed out of the well and that helps you produce it. That reservoir pressure helps you produce it. But also remember that this is all happening in rock, porous rock that oil and gas can flow through and so it's not really always exactly this systematic and this clear delineation between the oil and the water. And if you pump too fast, you can get that water mixed in with the oil. Well, that has a bunch of negative consequences. One is because the water is heavier, that means it's harder and harder to pump that mix of oil and water out of the well. The other problem is, you know, typically you don't want to produce the water. Typically that water has a lot of impurities, maybe heavy metals in it, etc., that uh, you have to make sure don't get released to the environment. And so you're going to have to pay money to separate that water from that oil and then to dispose of that water. And so typically the more water that gets mixed in the oil, the less and less valuable that mixed oil and water stream becomes from that well and the harder that you have to pump. And so the allowables are often lowered to prevent a you know, race for production mixing up all those products in the well. So we can just systematically squeeze out that oil over time to maximize overall recovery. I want to talk a little bit about a Pickens case, and we're going to see there's lots of cases uh, named Pickens, and we'll, we'll see why that is. But this is a Texas case, you can tell, because it's a Railroad Commission case. It's on page 720 in your book. And it's a case about a situation where the Railroad Commission does a little bit carefuler job of determining what those allowables should be. And what happens here is the Railroad Commission actually determines the allowables not just based on acreage but also based on the volume of the reservoir. So as is described in the book, this reservoir is described as kind of like a pancake where it's thicker in the middle and thinner on the edges. When I make pancakes, that's not how I like them to be. I like them to be kind of the same thickness, but you know, that's how you make pancakes is up to you. And obviously there was a different idea at work in this case. But the basic allegation by Pickens in this case is, I have the thick part of the reservoir under my property. And so there, even though I'm on the same amount of acreage, I have a bigger amount of volume. And so using this measurement of volume, right, which is acre feet, acre is area, the feet in height is so acre feet, that's a volume measurement. And so Pickens says, you know what, we should have decided the allowables not on the acreage, but on the acre feet, on the volume underneath our properties, because I'm on the thicker, thicker, juicier part of the reservoir, I should get more of the oil. And remember why we mostly use acreage for allowables. It's a simplifying assumption, which is that, well, if you all have the same amount of acreage, you probably have the same amount of oil and gas under your property on the shared reservoir. But what Pickens is saying here is, you know, we know better in this case. Normally we have to make that assumption because we don't know what the reservoir looks like. But here we actually know how much volume is under each property. And so that's what should be used to determine our allowables. So Pickens argues Railroad Commission didn't have substantial evidence for this rule that kind of both mixes the acreage measurement and the acre feet and says, you know what, this case should be done just based on acre feet. The court, however, says it won't disturb the finding. We'll talk about the reason for that and see how it's kind of a typical reason 
when you challenge the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, here the Texas Railroad Commission, on its technical expertise. So in this case, we have this battle of the experts between the Railroad Commission experts and Pickens' experts. Now, Pickens' experts say this. They say, look, we're having pumping at the edges that is draining the center of the reservoir. And so, in effect, oil and gas that's under Pickens land is being produced from these properties on the periphery and that's unfair because Pickens isn't getting a reasonable opportunity to produce the oil and gas under his land. The Railroad Commission experts say, you know what, actually as these other parties on the periphery produce their oil and gas, oil and gas tends to gather in the middle and so Pickens is going to produce it. And actually there's an interesting issue here which is even if we knew how much oil and gas exactly was under e any property, how could we tell if the allowables were correctly calculated? Because, you know, we could say, well, 60% of the oil is under Pickens' property. And so should, does that mean that at any one time, Pickens should be getting 60% of the oil? Not necessarily, because the other issue here is that Production is going to vary over time. And one of the things that the Railroad Commission is saying is that over time, those producers on the periphery, their wells are going to water out and they're no longer going to get any production. Whereas Pickens will continue producing from that center of the reservoir. So when you try to figure out is Pickens getting his fair share, you can't just look at how much is being produced today. You have to guess in the future for decades to come how long is that well going to last and is pickens going to end up over time be getting a larger share because his wells are going to last longer as you can see this involves very difficult questions of petroleum engineering and is certainly the kind of thing you would expect the railroads commission to have expertise in and so maybe it's not surprising that the court says look i'm not sure who's right between these experts but certainly the Railroad Commission experts know what they're doing. They might be wrong in this case, but I'm not the petroleum engineer to correct them. And so the Railroad Commission's decision is going to stand. So I would contrast this case with those cases like the uh, Patty case, like the Larson case, where the plaintiff, rather than challenging the technical expertise, of the commission, which is hard to do. In those other cases, the plaintiff challenged their legal interpretation, which is a little bit easier to do because the courts are more willing to overrule the commissions on their legal interpretations. All right, last case on this topic, Denver producing versus state. This is a case from Oklahoma in 1947 on page 726 in your book. The Oklahoma Corporation Commission, which remember is Oklahoma's oil and gas regulator, sets an oil to gas or gas to oil ratio of 2 MCF versus a barrel of oil. And when that ratio is exceeded, you have to stop producing even though you haven't yet produced your pro production allowable of oil. Okay, so in this case, Denver Producing makes the typical objection, which says, wait a second, first of all, natural gas is valuable. So what's so wrong with producing natural gas? Secondly, when you stop us from producing, all of a sudden, we're, what happened to our right to try and produce the oil and gas under our land? I guess it's just gone because we can no longer produce this well. That seems unfair. It doesn't protect our correlative rights. The court here shows the kind of latitude that courts will give to these conservation commissions when they make rules that are designed to protect the reservoir and everybody's production from the oil and gas reservoir. Court says, look, there are conservation benefits from preserving that gas. As we described, when you have a gas cap drive reservoir, that means gas is trying to expand down. That squeezes oil out of the reservoir. That oil is more valuable than that natural gas, almost always. And so we don't want you to produce that natural gas, even if it has value, because we want to maximize the production of oil, and the conservation agency has to consider that. Here, the court says it was appropriate for the Oakland, Oklahoma Corporation Commission to do so, and so Denver Producing loses its challenge.